All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this run of Kill Trotmeyer's Tongue. Uh, it's an RTA category, so we start on Xavius and uh, just going to start right off with the run, then get into describing what it is. All right, starting in three, two, one. So the first 10 or 15 minutes of this run is going to be the same as most other uh, speedruns that you've seen in this game, just standard, no major glitches. Uh, but this category shows off a lot of the major glitches that this game has to offer. And those categories aren't well known even to experienced runners because almost everyone concentrates on the no major glitches categories. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, joined on commentary by Nobody Nava. Hello, that's me. Happy to be here. Yeah, so, uh, kill Crockermeyer's tongue. So the main thing is, so, you know, you may know that with the standard Crockermeyer fight, you're just trying to push him back into the acid, and Crockermeyer doesn't really have uh, a health value. But, in, oddly enough, his tongue does, but it's only vulnerable to power bond damage. And he yeah. has... His tongue has a lot of health. So, yeah, so Krakenmeyer's tongue is actually considered a separate enemy from Krakenmeyer himself, um, which might seem a little bit weird. If you if you think about how it's actually implemented under the hood, it makes a lot of sense because his tongue just kind of sits there and wiggles and doesn't really do anything else. And so to make the code simpler, they just put all that logic in another enemy and it's to not make the, the Krakenmeyer's code more complex. Um, there's a lot of different things in the game that work that way. Like, Fantoon is actually four enemies. His eye is a separate enemy. His tentacles are separate enemies. Um, Ridley's tail is a separate enemy from Ridley himself. And a lot of other things in the game like that that you wouldn't expect to be enemies are considered enemies. And in all, every one of those cases, the game developers give those, like, secondary technical enemies 32,767 HP and they make it in invulnerable to all forms of damage, except they forgot to make Croc's tongue invulnerable to power bombs, which means we can kill it. Uh, just a quick note, we had a sudden thunderstorm appear here, so uh, I, I hope that doesn't cause any issues, but if I suddenly drop offline, then uh, <laughs> maybe it's because of that. Uh, but yeah, so... With such a high HP value on Crocked Miner's Tongue, um, it takes a lot of power bombs in order to in order to kill it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if if my math is right, that would be 164 power bomb hits because each power bomb hit does 200 damage, but each power bomb can hit twice, so that would make um, 84 power bombs if my math is correct. I, th I think that's right. I Which, can't remember yeah. off the top of my head. But but the problem that we run into then is that there aren't that many power bomb packs in the game. Uh, there's about there's 50 power bombs in the game. One of them is behind Croc, so you could come into Croc with a theoretical maximum of I believe 45 power bombs. Which means that without major glitches, without somehow managing to artificially increase your power bomb count. The only way to kill Krakenmeyer's tongue is to farm the fireballs he spits for power bombs during the fight, which has like, I think about a 2% drop rate or something ridiculously low like that, and so it takes over half an hour. Um, so you could you could do Underflow Dark Zoa, but Chavo actually has a um, much cooler route than that because this is a full-on major glitches category there is no glitch that is considered too too severe there's nothing that we can't do in this category and so you're going to see i'm not i'm not going to spoil things but you'll see quite a lot of tech that you would not normally see in a run of this game yeah and then uh like inner rules for no major glitches so one of them is no out of bounds which we are going out of bounds in this run. One of them is no space-time beam, and we are using space-time beam in this run. 
And then the other rule that we have is that you must collect items from their intended source. And we are not doing that in this run. <laughs> we are collecting an item from an unintended source. So we are breaking every single rule of the no major glitches categories. So the beginning of this run is starting out pretty similar to a GT Classic or a GT Space Time run. Because Chabo is going to, since since um, no major glitches normally says we can't do the GT code, we, we can do GT code. We're just going to use that to get basically a full item loadout right, right off the start instead of having to spend a whole bunch of time just going around and collecting items. So you'll see that typical GT code, you know, go through the early game, low percent as possible, grab Varia and beeline straight to straight to lower north there. Yeah, I forgot about no GT code that it, that is usually. It's GT code isn't a major glitch, but you know, that's usually implied for no major glitches runs as well. So charge beam is not required for uh in order to, to get GT code, but I do it for safety and comfort. So we we do have some runners that that like to do the no major glitches category of this run. Yeah, but. one of those is I believe the current world record holder is Idol, who uh, did provided us with amazing commentary for the last run, and then Fat Scott is the other uh, person who is well known for running that category. So cheesy, the fireballs that Croc spits have a two percent power bomb drop rate, uh, or I think that number is correct. I didn't double check it. So yeah, it's a it's a thirty to forty minute Croc fight without major glitches. Obviously, we're going to be speeding that up quite a lot. Um, yeah, it's that's that's why there's only like two people who run this category, no major glitches. It just takes a really long time, and it is incredibly RNG heavy because you know if you get good or bad power bomb to drop luck that can that can change the, the outcome of the fight dramatically. Okay. Funtoon has those numbers for us. It's a 3.92% chance of dropping a power bomb for the, the orbs that Krakemeyer spits. So yeah, Chabo's just done an early red tower to get power bombs that will allow us to open the door going down to uh, where Golden Chorizo lives. And then we're heading back down red tower, gonna fight Kray to get Varia so we don't have to do hell runs. Other than that, this is a relatively standard early game for a for a Kray first, or especially a GT Classic sort of category. Oh, that's a cool strap to do, to roll under the blocks and jump across. I don't think I've seen that before. I didn't realize you could you could make it without um, having without shooting all the blocks and getting more run speed. Uh yeah, it's fairly standard. Um, uh, you you have to wall jump if you do it that way, but uh, it's fairly standard for like KPDR. Yeah, that makes sense. Is it a full height jump, or do you have to avoid bonking the ceiling? Uh, that one you can do full height because, um, you know, you don't have as much run speed. Nice. Alright, and got the great quick kill. Very nice. Going with the, the 2 plus 3 strat. 
Uh, no, I, I do uh, charge plus four. Ah. Uh, and that's part of the reason I grab char charge beam is I'm not great at two plus three, so it uh, makes raid fight more comfortable for me. That makes sense. All right, so now that we have our various suit, we are heading straight on down to Lower Norfair. Are you a are you a boots or bootless kind of guy, Chavo? I do high jump boots, and uh, so gonna be doing two tank as well. Makes sense. Might have bumped the pillar on on the energy tank. We'll see. Yep, I did. Oh well. Doesn't matter because I'm gonna be uh, killing Zova on the way out anyway. On missiles full on health. Very nice. This is another place that charge beam is useful. As a DBX strat called the screwball. I, I jumped pretty high, but that still worked for it. Oh cool. Oh that's that's really neat. I haven't seen that one before. Yeah, DBX is an old school runner. Uh, probably like 2013 or so. So, uh, wow. I know Zos. Before my time. <laughs> yeah, I know Zos showed the strat in his old tutorial from like 2014, but I'm not sure many people do it these days. All right, I have All zero right. supers, so uh, <laughs> need to farm at least one. But I'm just gonna go to full. There we go. If not, also not taking the save, but don't worry, Chabo does have a safety save. So if something yeah. if something does go wrong in lava dive, then we will be able to continue the run. Find myself with that ledge, jump through the door. Oh, I bonked during the lava dive, but since I have two tanks, I'll be fine. There we go. Seventy-five health to spare. Very nice. Beautifully done. All right, so. I'll go ahead and start talking about what's going to happen right after the GT code fight, because we're going to get kind of a lot all at once there. Um, one of the things that GT code gives you is it gives you all of the beams and it gives you all of them enabled at the same time, which is not normal. You're not supposed to be able to have both spacer and plasma. And if you try to fire a beam with both spacer and plasma enabled, you get some weird effects that usually just end up crashing the game. And the reason will, for this I will is... just say Green gate, gate glitch first try. <laughs> I did not oh, expect very that. Very nice. <laughs> but the, the reason for those those glitches is that the game uses the beams that you have enabled along with other things like your the direction you're aiming and whether the beam is charged to look up a table and decide what code to run based on the beam. And if you have an invalid beam, like in this case, charge, ice, space, or plasma, then this happens. Uh, basically, it reads this table out of bounds and runs the wrong code. And with the right setup, you can end up getting some interesting memory corruption effects. This is called space-time beam. 
So, Chabo just triggered what's called a wrong warp, which is where you use space time to, cor to corrupt memory and trigger a door transition that takes you to the wrong spot. So, now Chabo ended up somewhere out of bounds in landing site. He's going to find a find a door to fix that, get himself back in bounds, and then now he's going to be going for the for the fun part of this of this run. All right, so right now, so, yeah, uh, what I'm doing is charging up a shine spark, and what I'm trying to do is then do a stationary spin jump so that I can uh, do a wall jump check on the door transition block on the same frame that I activate the shine spark. So then when I go into the uh, next room, I can have the sharp shine spark go partially into the door. Got the wall jump check without the shine spark there. I need to, I need to be what's known as deep stuck. Uh, just being stuck in the door like that isn't good enough. Yeah, veteran, this setup is really similar to the uh, RTA zero percent strats. Yeah. So. Uh... The next several minutes are going to be uh, going to be familiar to anyone who's seen zero percent, but it's not really used for anything outside of that. And it always takes some tries. It's easier than Taco Tank. It's it's not free <laughs> at all. It's yeah. it's a couple of I think it's a couple of frame perfect inputs. You have to um, you have to do a spin jump with exactly one frame of momentum, so that you do a stationary spin jump instead of a forward spin jump. And then you also have to frame perfectly activate the wall jump check and the shine spark at the right height. There we go. Uh, just double checking, I have morph. Yeah, I have morph disabled. Very nicely done. And now, so now X-ray climbing a few screens up. Do you want to explain that? Yeah. So basically, what, what he's doing right now is called X-ray climbing. He is activated. He is deactivating X-ray scope while crouched and turning around. So what happens is when you turn off x-ray scope, the game tries to see if you're in a standing pose. And if you're not, it tries to put you on a normal standing pose. And if you're in a crouched turning around pose when you turn off x-ray, it puts you back into a standing pose. And that actually lets you climb a few pixels up. Because every time you crouch, it pulls Samus's feet up. It keeps her center at the same height. And then every time you uncrouch using x-ray, it keeps Samus's feet at the same height and moves her center up a few pixels. And so every every X-ray scope activation lets Chabo move up just a few pixels. Um, and then that all also, also lets us have a light switch rave. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, but the, the the goal of this, like this isn't light switch rave percent, it's kill Crocs Tongue RTA and major glitches. So um so yeah, we're, we are now out of bounds. And in this game, when you go out of bounds, what basically happens is there's this big buffer in memory that stores all the room data. And your position is not actually bounds checked when it looks up blocks in this in this big buffer in memory. The, the game expects the level geometry to keep you from going out of bounds. And so if you use glitches to, to clip through walls and doors and climb out, then then you can like start exploring other parts of memory and end up in this world of garbage tiles where just the bytes that you find elsewhere in memory get interpreted as blocks. Uh, Chabo is going to be navigating out of bounds for the next several minutes in order to find a very specific value in memory that we call the god block. And the reason why it's called the god block is because it can do it can do literally anything. It's basically a full arbitrary code execution block. So what this what this block does is 
when you interact with, there's certain types of interactable blocks in the game that'll spawn in an object that we call a PLM, a post-load modification. Oh no. And... <laughs> did right. something go wrong? Uh, yeah. I fell when I didn't want to and uh, then hit a transition block and that soft logged me. Oh no. <laughs> so I need to go to a backup save. Yeah, fortunately we do have backup save, so this is not the end of the run. Um, but that does mean that he'll have to redo that, um, the, the door check set up and then the x-ray climb again. Drive faster this time. Yeah, rush light pretty much. Um, it's not it's not it's it's kind of funny because a lot of the a lot of the memory that you end up in when you go out of bounds is just like other layers of room data or like data from previous rooms that were loaded or um, various various things like that. Like it still mostly has to do with room data because the, the, the buffer that stores the room data is in a separate bank that doesn't have a lot of extra interesting stuff in it. But yes, you can get a lot of weird glitched tiles. You can get, um, you can get into like mirror copies of the room. You can, you can end up like going in the background layer. So there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of just weird stuff that can happen when you go out of bounds. It's the, the possibilities are pretty endless. The game can be just broken wide open without a bounds, which is why like you don't get to see it very much in runs because if you're allowed to go out of bounds, you can just beat the game pretty much right away. So that's why that's why a category like this where we're going out of bounds, well, but like going out of bounds doesn't kill Croc's time. You have to go out of bounds, use it to get power bombs and then come back in bounds. But yeah, the, the complexity of Out of Bounds really comes down to how many different factors influence these contents of memory. Um, there's there's a lot of depth and a lot of really complicated setups that go into manipulating Out of Bounds to actually have the right tiles that you want and figuring out how to get, get that all to happen. And I think... I don't know a lot about that wow. part of how, how these setups are found. Uh, right. But I think Did something go wrong again. Uh, yeah, uh, hit another transition block. Uh, uh, so I I got stuck in between uh like a slope block and a solid block, and then when I got out of it, then uh I was you know in in a place that I wasn't familiar with, and I didn't know the the exact layout around me, and yeah, hit transition block by mistake. Uh, yeah, there are tools. The The main tool that is used is a hitbox viewer that lets you actually see what's going on out of bounds. Because, well, first of all, the camera doesn't follow us. Um, like the camera is just stuck in in the main room. You can see Samus on screen, but that's you're not actually seeing Samus where she is. When Samus is off screen, and the camera's not following her, then her position will like wrap around to be on screen. Um, and then also the other problem is that how a tile behaves and how it looks are completely independent in Super Metroid. So every tile has a like graphics ID that depend defines its appearance, and then also some some metadata about it that defines how it behaves and so like even if you even if the camera did follow you out of bounds you wouldn't learn anything useful just from looking at the tiles so there's a there's the most the most useful way to learn what's in out of bounds is with tasking tools there's scripts for tasking emulators that'll let you actually see the real functions of the tiles that you're 
exploring. Um, there's also there's also hitbox viewers that you can run on a console, either with a modified ROM or with a PC that's hooked up using USB to SNES. So I believe I believe these setups would have all been found using using those hitbox viewers, and then with a lot of work developing like normalized cues and strategies to be able to actually do the, the out of bounds navigation blind, which as we're seeing is is not straightforward. It's pretty complicated to try to figure out how to like navigate through all of this garbled memory when when you have things like gravity that causes you to fall through all of the all of the zero zero bytes and um, weird interactions between like slopes and doors and tiles all crash the game and stuff like that. It's hard to tell what's going on from this movement just by looking at the screen, but it's incredibly complicated and technical. Nice. Looks like we're door stuck once again. Yep. So. Yeah, and uh, in order to, even after you find your way through with a hitbox viewer, then you need to figure out a combination of visual cues, audio cues, and any, anything else that you need in order to navigate your way without being able to see what the tiles are around you. Yeah, this time I'll be quiet so I don't mess up your audio cues. <laughs> no, that, that wasn't the problem, but... to do another stationary spin jump. I'll line myself up pixel perfectly. So I can create the god block using X-ray. I run into a solid block here, and then above me is the god block, but just to the right of the solid block is a uh, glitch block that I want to change. So that did that. All right. So now I am running to the right for quite a while. So uh, do you want to explain like how X-Ray changes blocks? Yeah. So. This is a this is a glitch that's not actually caused by being out of bounds, but by using X-ray while off screen. Uh, there is a when you when you activate X-ray, the game calculates these big lookup tables of of graphics for the like beam visor effect, and if and it does this based on Samus's position off screen. If you're off screen when you activate X-ray, then it ends up writing beam visor data to the wrong location in memory, and so. By doing that with this specific setup, Chabo is able to actually write bytes into a location that he can then run to to go visit. Um, the the reason why he's why he's doing this is because 
this this god lock that he, that he was talking about needs to be created in a very specific position because what a god block does and the reason why it's called a god block is because when you touch this block every block in the game has like an interaction handler for when you touch it based on the the bite values of the block and if you touch a god block it's that's just a block with a very specific bite value that causes some tables to get read about out of bounds and actually tries running it looks at samus's x position and it runs whatever whatever code is at the location in memory whose address corresponds to samus's x position so we can literally run any code that we want just by if we can create a god block at an x position corresponding to that code that we want to run and then going and touching that block so yeah that's what chabo did there he created a god block at a very specific x position when we touch that block the game is going to read Samus's exposition and then interpret that as a location in memory to find some code and the code that it's going to run is happens to be a piece of code that will add 127 to Samus's power bomb count so that's how we managed to get all those power bombs that we need to be able to kill Krakenmeyer's tongue without spending 35 minutes farming power bombs and interestingly uh the version of this that we use for 0% sets your power bomb count to 127 but for this one uh we have we have a setup instead that adds 127 to your current count so since i have 20 uh then it'll make it 147 all right i'm now on the correct platform so i just need to go right until i run into that bomb block and then jump and turn around in midair and then bunny hop to the left and now I've touched it so now drop down and run to All the right. right and I now have 147 power bombs very nice as you can see the game does not expect the 10th digit of your power bomb count to be 14 and so it draws is it like an elevator or something? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it's part of the map, I don't know. Now one thing I need to make sure that I do is not pick up a power bomb. So if I killed those crabs and they dropped a power bomb, uh... Oh, it, yeah, because your because, it doesn't increase your maximum power bombs, does yeah, it? Yeah, so because my maximum power bomb, bomb count is still 20, if I were to pick up a drop, it would be like, oh, well, you know, picked up a drop. Are you greater than 20? Yes. So we'll set, set it to 20. That door is already open. Oops. Okay. I, I think those boats can drop power bombs, so I need to avoid that. All right. The reason I grab screw attack here Probably doesn't save time overall, but it's fun. Nice. These threes have a very yes, small chance of power bombs. Need to be careful with them. Oh no. Okay, we're fine. Nice spring balls. Yep, try to get through those rooms without losing momentum. And with that, we're all good to head on down to Croc. Just just the speedway left between us and his tongue. Yep, and I don't want to shoot here because those Dispedas have a very high chance of power bomb uh, drops. Okay. Yep. Just gonna run on through them. Yep. All right, now Croc Speedway. All right. All right. Now there's one last bit of tech that you're gonna see in this run that you would not see in a No Major Glitches Kill Croc's Tongue run, and that is going to be 
clipping out of bounds once more. So every time we every time we hit Croc with a power bomb, he gets really mad and he charges us. Um, as you can see, Chavo is laying those power bombs as close as he can to Croc's tongue so that they'll double hit his tongue, so that we only need what was it? 82 of them instead of 164. But eventually Croc gets all the way over to this wall and pushes us into the spikes. So what Chavo is going to do, like, he's fine here for a while, he can power bomb Croc's tongue, but as you can see, those spikes keep hitting him and taking away his health. So once his health gets low enough, he can actually do a crystal flash and use that to clip out of bounds into the ceiling so that he won't take spike damage anymore. He can just hang out right above Croc, throw power bombs at Croc's tongue, and that'll make Croc keep charging forward and stay in this one spot. And then we can just hang out here and kill his tongue in just a couple minutes. I need my reserves to be empty in order to crystal flash. All right, now I'm gonna wait just to make sure that Oh no! <laughs> I think I was bounced up by the spike or something. Alright. Uh... Oh no! I have another save. Very nice. Came prepared. Needs uh, anything, give it up for Chapo. This has <laughs> been an amazing run so far, despite a couple of minor mishaps. This is one of the coolest things that we've seen at this marathon so far. I think I need to let Croc back off because I may not be high enough in the spikes. Right. Exact, how come that breaks what? Why did the crystal flash not work? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, I believe it was it was a spike hit that bounced Chabo up a couple pixels right as the CF was about to go off. So, in order to activate a crystal flash, you need there's a few different conditions. The game checks for CF activation on the very last frame of the power bomb explosion, and on that frame, you must be holding the inputs for CF. You must meet all the ammo and energy requirements, and you must also be at the same exact pixel position that you that the power bomb was laid. So since that that spike bounces Samus up just a little bit, if if it does so at just the wrong time and she's like a pixel higher than she was when she laid the power bomb, then the crystal flash won't come out. Yeah, and I, I think that's happened to me literally once before, but of course marathon walk. <laughs> There we go. Okay. And now yeah, we're nice home free. Flash. So now the, the rest of the run, I can just keep laying power bombs and Proxton will eventually die. Smellon, I don't know if it's possible to get like back down out of the ceiling. Um, it is possible to activate a door transition and leave Crox room from the ceiling. Uh, you can actually skip the Croc fight in this way if you want. If I had one more super, then uh, I could crystal flash again, and then X-ray climb, and then escape. Ah, uh, we're too stuck uh, to, to get out. Yeah, 
got that. Right <laughs> now, right now, I think I'm just soft locked. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the timer ends as soon as the last power bomb hits Croc's tongue. So Croc has its mouth closed, so we won't be able to see that. But I think we should be able to see a little explosion on Croc's mouth when this time dies. There's usually an ammo drop. Uh, pirate, the the time doesn't matter in terms of like speed. Um, the 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 the, the power bomb hits the hits the tongue whether Croc's mouth is open or not. The, the tongue doesn't go away when he closes his mouth. It's just that the tongue is positioned behind Croc graphically, so when his mouth is closed, the tongue is not visible. Exactly, Stratlog. Just a few left. Uh, you, you'll look for the explosion near the back of Croc's mouth. There it is. And Croc has no more tongue. Waiting for it to come through on the restream. There, <laughs> okay. I see it. <laughs> All right, and that's it. Uh, Rock thanks goes. everyone for watching. Thanks any for for hosting this event. It's been it's been real fun, and uh, hope everyone enjoyed this silly category that can showcase uh, so many amazing glitches of this game. Yeah, thank you so much, Charbo. Thank you for showing us some of the some of the ways that the game can be broken, and some of the things that we might not, some of the tech and cool discoveries that we might not get to see in in a normal like any percent or hundo run. Congratulations and thanks for thanks for the show. Thanks.